A move is on to cut new local non-communicable diseases by half. Barbados and Panama sign a memorandum of understanding aimed at establishing a business bridge between the two countries. The central bank governor encouraging investment for resilience. And in sports, Bailey's and West Terrace dominate at today's knapsack. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowen. With estimates indicating that 8 out of 10 deaths in Barbados is caused by non-communicable diseases, government is on a mission to see a 50% reduction in new non-communicable diseases cases as part of its six missions contained in the Mission Barbados Declaration. And Minister of State in the Ministry of Health, Davidson Ishmael, says the implementation of the National Strategic Plan Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases 2023-2030 to will assist in this regard. Guard. The strategic plan for NCD control 2023-2030 reflects this urgency by providing a comprehensive framework consisting of eight priority areas aimed at tackling the rising burden of NCDs. More specifically, the strategic plan emphasizes the reduction of risk factors such as tobacco use, unhealthy consumption of alcohol, poor nutrition and sedentary lifestyles through educational initiatives and policy interventions targeting communities, schools, and workplaces. Mr. Ishmael was speaking during the second installation of the National Nutrition Center Nutrition Conference at the Radisson Aquata Resort this morning, operating under the theme Good Nutrition, a prescription for NCD prevention and control, as one of the many activities held to mark Nutrition Month. Meanwhile, head of Phillips Boys, education officer in the secondary section of the Ministry of Education, says the Barbados School Nutrition Policy, which was implemented last April, has been working, but she is calling on government to intervene and assist with the vending policy, as education was key to ensuring full compliance with the nutrition policy. Our problem is with the students um, given to support to the vendors out of school. I was at one particular school with a nutritionist and at minutes, at two o'clock, around two o'clock, we saw a beeline go towards the vendors and they were selling the unhealthy snacks. So we, we're going to undermine this initiative if we do not address the vendors. The, the change can be made, but we need to have those vendors addressed. Ms. Phillips Boyce added that the overall intention was to change eating habits and although it would not happen in one day, baby steps need to be taken to achieve full compliance. Many Barbadians migrated to Panama to work on the Panama Canal, creating a niche for themselves in the Panamanian market. That relationship has now taken on a new look, this time with the signing of a memorandum of understanding to create a bridge for business between both countries. Trevor Thorpe has more. Since August 1975, Barbados and Panama established diplomatic relations and have since enjoyed a positive and productive partnership with almost 110 years of historical linkages. And yesterday, both countries strengthened bilateral relations with the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the Barbados Chamber of Commerce and Pro-Panama Export and Investment Promotion Authority at the Savannah Hotel. According to Donna Ford, Director General, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Barbados' decision to finally establish a diplomatic presence here are strong signals of both governments' mutual efforts to strengthen bilateral partnerships. The government of Barbados is firmly committed to building on strengthening our historical relationship through education, tourism, cultural exchanges, commerce and trade, and activities such as these. These initiatives permit us to commemorate and celebrate our historical and cultural links and increase opportunities for enhanced cooperation and commercial exchanges. Similarly, James Clark, President of the Barbados Chamber of Commerce, says this initiative is a strategic opportunity to further promote economic growth, entrepreneurship and innovation. We see the presence of the Embassy of Panama as a gateway to new horizons, offering our local businesses unprecedented access to the dynamic Panamanian market and its myriad of opportunities. 
Over the past 26 years, exports from Barbados to Panama have witnessed a steady ascent from 24,700 US dollars in 1995 to a noteworthy 890,000 US dollars in 2021. Meanwhile, Her Excellency Janewa Tawani Menkomo, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama, says the Caribbean has always been at the forefront of global change, but notes that it was still, in many ways, a house divided. She says this further strengthening of relations will now deepen and signal a new way forward. We are neighbors, we are brothers and sisters, but we don't act like it. We have spent centuries looking beyond our region and past each other from meaning, ideas, and answers. We need to overcome that. We need to turn our differences into strengths, and we need to do it now. Because my friends, the truth is, the Caribbean has always been at the forefront of global change. Those in attendance were also treated to some Panamanian wares, which will soon be available to the general public. Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. Investment for resilience. That was the message from Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, Dr. Kevin Greenwich, as he and other panelists discussed the topic on the Caribbean Economic Forum, how to achieve inclusive, sustainable economic growth for Barbados over the medium to long term. The top banking official told the forum that Barbados will always be vulnerable to economic shocks, whether they are internal in terms of prices or external due to weather or other hazards. Whatever it is, we need to prepare for it. So getting inclusive growth and sustainable growth means getting the necessary investment um, to be able to build up our resilience, both in terms of our infrastructure, in terms of our buffers, so that when that shock comes, we can recover. We've said that under the BERT program, we need the government is stepping up to roughly 5% of GDP. Um, <clears throat> By, and government needs to do that by carefully managing its fiscal position. And we need the private sector to step up and double its investment to about $2 billion annually. The central bank governor has also called for diversification within the economy in tandem with investment and he gave some details. Diversify within tourism, but at the same time building linkages between tourism and all the other sectors. And developing newer industries, like the creative industries, the shift of renewable energy and greening the economy. And this is the concept. If you can build this sort of uh, structure, this sort of uh, a sustainable environment, this sort of sustainable growth, then you will get hit, but the recovery will be much faster. And build it in such a way to build up the social programs, education and training, and investing in, 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 in human resource so that every citizen is part of this inclusive group. The Mia Motley government is about home ownership for Barbadians, not home rental. Word of this from Minister of Housing Dwight Sutherland as he addressed a Barbados Labour Party branch meeting at Cuthbert Moore Primary School for the St. George North constituency. Minister Sutherland stressed that government was trying to move away from the whole rental concept. He wants to see average people owning their own properties in Barbados, as according to him, paying rent is dead money. Minister Sutherland says this was clearly spelt out in the recent budget and financial statement of government, which focused on three key areas, growth, resiliency and people-centered programs. That's why our budget was premised on three things, growth, Resiliency for Barbadians and Barbados, and people-centered. And people-centered speaks to empowerment and enfranchisement of our people. And that's what housing is about when you own a house in this country. Rent money is dead money. And some may ask, why is it taking so long? We can build the houses and put people in them to rent. Is that really what we want to do as a government? We don't want to do that. We are pushing ownership, empowering the people. Minister Sutherland says it is all about building generational wealth so that poor people can get away from the cramped housing conditions that they have been subjected to. When you knock on doors in housing units in this country and you realize 
that a two bedroom unit occupies 15 and 16 persons you would understand why this government is adamant that we must build housing in this country and people must own them it brings tears to your eyes when you go into these housing estates and you see 15 a grandmother with a daughter with two daughters and their daughters have children and their children their daughters children have children and all live in a two and three bedroom unit we'll take a break but coming up a government senator is asking young barbadians to pay attention to the country's development Independent Senator Kevin Boyce is asking government to give a tax credit to pensioners. Senator Boyce said pensioners are facing a situation where their pension funds are taxed twice. He made the comments in the upper chamber while contributing to the debate on the Appropriations Bill 2024. How do we encourage persons to supplement the NAS? Give us the tax credit for the pensions. Or, if we can't get the tax credits in terms of removing the 25% withdrawal of lump sum, give us some recognition or some incentive or some balancing out in terms of the income tax as to why we should be encouraged to save for our pensions. We're being penalized for it, sir. Mm -hmm. This is something which is within the government's ambit, and we recognize now we recognize now because it was settled in the government's presentation with regard to the concept of concessions and how much it costs government. Perhaps then we can descend to particulars on the issue of pensions and see what can be done. I refuse to believe that we as a nation and a government this articulate is unable to solve that problem, sir. Government Senator Gregory Nichols is asking young Barbadians to keep their eyes on the domestic dimension of the country's development. He also wants them to closely monitor the external realities that have an impact on the nation's development. Senator Nichols made the call while speaking on the appropriations bill in the upper chamber. There is no debate between the two. There are parallel lines that don't intersect. But if you step out of sync in either dimension, you will fail the people of this country. I understand that governance has become more complex, Mr. President. I understand that the, 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 the traditional talking points of, your political, of the political side, we get into this cut and trust. We knock the hospital, we knock this, we knock the other side of the road. But let us build a consensus about taking the country forward. Because one thing I would say, I welcome the return of the Democratic Labour Party to the political stage in this chamber. But well, I welcome the opportunity, which I don't think I have had to debate on policy and policy mixes that are right for the country. We will not get it all right, Mr. President. I still believe, Mr. President, that the goal of building a good society should be the enduring mission of this generation of members of both houses of parliament. Government Senator the Reverend Charles Morris cautioned about using the plights of the poor as a political football. He sought to dispel the contributions of the opposition Democratic Labour Party senators as he defended the government. Reverend Morris reminded in the midst of COVID-19, government kept people employed and provided assistance unlike some first world countries. Senator Morris, a veteran educator, is in support of education reform. We need education reform. Because at every juncture in history, when there was a development in education and technology, you had the concomitant transformation in education. Senator Patricia Paris wants to know if the budget to the Prime Minister's office is cut, who will help the vulnerable families? Speaking on the debate in the Upper House, she says a number of those families were discovered during COVID-19 through the Survival Program Survey. She says the 1,500 people look forward to the assistance, as do those from the Adopt a Family Program. Families look forward to receiving that $600 monthly to assist them 
because as we know, there were several persons who were laid off as a result of COVID and they did not have an income coming to the household. Mr. President, this program is managed very well by the Prime Minister's office. Only recently, in another place, we heard the call for the Prime Minister's budget to be cut. I am saying that when this budget, if this budget is cut, how would these families be able to survive? Senator Paris added that the programs also work towards getting the individuals to be gainfully employed and the Ministry of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs needs to be commended. We just did not go out there and handpick a thousand families. We did a needs assessment to cater to the needs of the families. An opportunity is also given to young persons between the ages of 16 and 24 to enroll in the Job Start program. Mr. President, another program for the people of Barbados, young people. Sports Night is brought to you by Power A. Pause is power. And by Dasani. Live first, Dasani after. Time for us now to head into Sports Night as we're joined by a very jubilant Anne-Marie Burke. Good <laughs> evening to you, Anne-Marie. Good evening to you, Pearson. And I start with news that Fashion Nation Bailey's Primary School Panthers and Williams Industries West Terrace Tigers swept the boys and girls titles in the Obadale Thompson and Patsy Calendar zones, respectively, in today's Sheffield Frosty's Knapsack Zonal Meet. Bailey's girls tallied 342 points, while the boys were runaway winners with a whopping 372 points. West Terrace conquered the girls in a Patsy calendar zone with 293.5 and in the boys they amassed 264.5. Here's a look at some of the 100 meters starting with the record run of Cameron at Academy of Providence who set a new time of 13.30 seconds in the under 13 boys race as he erased the old time of 13.58 set by Jaden Sobers of St. Catharines Primary back in 2011. So here we go though. Actually this is another section we just don't have the names for this section. But that looks like a lot from Providence. We will be taking that one. Off to a good start. See Brown Scott with a with a limp. Yeah, it seems like he's having some difficulty there. But in the meantime, to Johnny Nichols of Shirley Chisholm easily winning this one they're off again we will see the experience Shirley Chisholm Harvey has Harvey's gonna take it here we go bit of difficulty in maneuvering the lanes however not so for Remaya Aline of Hinesbury Primary Aline of Hinesbury Primary she holds on a good effort from Kima Burke of Bailey's Primary out there in lane number two. Off and running. Howard Kamabach, Pilgrim, Sergeant and King. And Asia Sergeant of St. Elizabeth. Yes, this girl has it signed and sealed and delivered. Easy win there for Asia Sergeant. They're off and running. A good clean start this time around. Let's see who will do the early running. It looks like uh, from West Terrace, Rosalie O'Neill. Yes, O'Neill has it. O'Neill, easy winner there. They're off and running. See ya, Alex Jones Eiffel. Alex Jones Eiffel of Williams Industries, West Terrace, <laughs> and Shaw Boating. 
to basketball now, Pilots have assured themselves of being the number one seed for the Cooperators General Insurance BABA Premier League playoffs. Last night in the top of the table clash with Fuji Boutique Station Hill Cavaliers, Pilots came out on top 73-70 to move to an unassailable 26 points with one regular season game to go. The Pilots were trailing for the majority of the game, but thanks mainly to Rashid Maynard and his game high 36 points, they came away with the win. Incidentally, the Cavs have also sewn up the number two seed position. Their regular season is over, but they have 25 points and cannot be caught by either Burger King Clapham Bulls or Camp Smart Assurance City United. The Cavs actually lost their last two games as they also went down to the Celtics recently at the BCC gym. CBC's Damien Best reports. Station Hill Cavaliers in green and black versus City United Celtics first half business. Stefan Otley sees the lane and drives to the hoop. Had 15 points on the night. The Celtics rebirth looking impressive after a slow start to the season. The steal, left hand and layup, no good. Put back works. Celtics playing with real purpose, moving the rock and attacking. Five players in double figures, leading the way. Joel Hunt with 23 and 13 boards. Renico Brewster adding 21. The Celtics please his punch up by 10 at half time. Captain Theron King from upstairs, beautiful sight. Celtics 52, Cavs 42. Second half, switch of ends, not much change in terms of the lead. And Anand Joseph Thorne for three, Sugar, 14 points in a till. Cavs in need of some respite. Of no concern to the Celtics though, 74 to 63, the lead with one quarter to go. The Cavaliers cleaned up their act at the right time. Otley says have some vital three-pointer. Captain Said Norval now with the spin move in the lane. Cavs within touching distance of a come from behind win. Compounding the situation, Celtics getting sloppy. Credit to Devron Knight who had 20 points and this man, Brandon Ruck, with 18. But the Celtics work diligently to secure the victory. Theo Greenwich says, this is our time. Big three. Then Brewster from the corner pocket drilled. The scoreline in the final analysis. City United Celtics 101. Cavaliers 98. Damien Best, CBC Sports. And the final race to the playoffs is between the Bulls and Celtics, with both teams aiming to avoid the number four seed because they'll have to take on the 13-0 undefeated Pylons in the semis. A win for Bulls tomorrow against the said Pylons at 8 p.m. at the Wildy Gym will give them the number three seed and a date with Cavaliers in the semifinals. The Business Report is brought to you with the kind compliments of the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. In tonight's business report, Panama's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Her Excellency Janina Tawani Mencomo, is viewing Barbados as an open door for trade and education for Panama to the Caribbean. She was speaking at a ceremony marking the establishment of the Panama Embassy in Barbados. She told the gathering at the Cafield campus of the University of the West Indies that the initiative will create new frontiers for people of both countries. This political presence here it feels just fair and just, and it's something that our country should have done probably, and we should have exchanged uh, these embassies, this political um, um, uh, collaboration before. But the world is a new world now. Things have changed now. Everything has changed completely. And it's time for us to reconnect to who we are, and I myself feel a little bit Barbadian, you say. And I think your culture has influenced us so much that I feel I'm part of it too. Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the UBE Cafield Campus, Professor Clive Landis, called it a momentous occasion given the historic ties that exist between Barbados and Panama. We see joint research activities, including the exchange of faculty members and research students. We see Panamanian students pursuing undergraduate and graduate degree programs in Barbados and vice versa. This is an excellent opportunity to improve bilingualism in both countries. We welcome joint seminars and conferences with our counterparts in Panama and with the embassy here. We look forward 
to Panama, Barbados relations 3.0 and to reinforcing our partnership for mutual benefit and for the benefit of our peoples and societies. Chairman of the Barbados Private Sector Association, Trisha Tannis, is calling for an education strategy to be put in place to stop the importation of labor. She says this needs to be critically considered since millions of dollars are spent on education annually and labor still has to be imported. She called for continuous dialogue with the private sector since incentives were given in the recent budget. The private sector needs to now really act very, very swiftly uh, once we have a clear definition of, as to how these rules and credits and incentives work to jump on board and take advantage of these opportunities. But having said that, it also needs to bring its own opportunities to the table and, and in so doing, um, essentially in collaboration with the government, sit down and understand how are we building these sectors and new industries out and how do we want to resource them. Then and only then, then we can create uh, competencies, we can create uh, syllabi and so on, or and curriculum around these new emerging industries so that we do have that pipeline that is going to feed eventually into the new, you know, more exciting um, industries that we have to, to tap into internationally. Time for the second half in sports, Anne-Marie. And I promise you some interesting news in ice skating. Six young skaters between the ages of 8 to 13 left the island for a four-week international ice skating development camp in Costa Rica for Latin America and Caribbean. Jaden O'Neill Marshall, Vashon Edwards, Dakari Benskin, Kimani Butcher, Kelsey Borg, and Anora Lewis will join national ice skater Priyanka Sharma over the next few days, honing their skills under the guidance of seven coaches from Canada. Organized and facilitated by the Barbados Ice Skating Association, these young skaters were chosen from their various local roller skate clubs with the aim of making the transition from wheels to blades. They'll be provided with new ice skates from global skate and blade manufacturer Jackson Ultima, while skating supplies will be from the figure skating boutique out of Toronto, Canada. President of the Barbados Skating Association, Raj Sharma, who traveled with the group, says the trip is also aimed at getting more persons involved in the sport. We have organized uh, a four-day camp, uh, have, are bringing coaches from Canada to teach these kids to transition from ground roller skating and speed skating to skating on an ice rink, uh, with the vision being to develop um, additional talent uh, locally um, to get to a very, very high performing level and eventually compete at national uh, international competitions for ice figure skating and ice speed skating as well. Um, when the kids do come back, they'll, they will have exercises to do uh, to keep up with their training on the ground uh, until we can do uh, an, another camp again with a you know, a, a long-term goal of developing a, an ice rink on the island. Sharma also revealed that the camp is part of the push for the Barbados Ice Skating Association to gain recognition under the sports world governing body. Barbados Ice Skating Association is uh, organizing this um, essentially to uh, get uh, membership into the International Skating Union, which is um, based in, in Switzerland. And once we get ISU membership, uh, following that, we will get Barbados Olympic Association membership with the goal of um, um, identifying and high-performing athletes, and some of which may qualify for the Milan 2026 Winter Olympic Games. Uh, so that's a goal that we have to put Barbados on the map for winter sports. The ice skating camp runs from tomorrow to March 31st. I will also see skaters from Argentina, Ecuador, Dominican Republic and host Costa Rica. Well, Jamaica's Kyle Gregg drove away with the recent motor rain club of Barbados Inc.'s Spring Blaze 24 doubleheaders sprint, that is, from society to Kendall and the reverse, with the action in either direction extremely keen. Let's go into the fast lane. As usual, the spectators were out in their numbers for the opening rally of the Barbados Rally 2 Championship. And Jamaica's Kyle Gregg left all of the competitors smelling his exhaust as he conquered the seventh stage event in a time of 21 minutes, 09.22 seconds behind the wheel of his Ford Fiesta Rally 2. 
on the penultimate run. Gray clock 2 minutes 59.17 seconds, beating Rob Swan by 1.2 seconds and easing into the lead by six times and then bettered his previous run by one hundredth of a second to win the day. Swan out of the UK in his squad of Fabio Rally 2 Evo put pressure on Greg for the entire day as it was back and forth tussle for the lead. Eventually, Swan, who's no stranger to the Belgian roads, will lose out by just one second, gaining 17 points to behind Greg in the championship race. Meanwhile, Josh Reed continues to run his Ford Fiesta R5 the Cobell oil machine, and at the end of the day, the local boy claimed that final podium finish with 0.24 seconds off the winner, Greg. Round out the top five was Roger the Ninja Hill in Skoda Fabia R5, and Mark Maloney behind the wheel of his Skoda Fabia Rally 2 Evo. Round two of the 2024 CBC Caribbean Barbados Rally 2 Championship will be the shakedown stages, the preamble to Sol Rally Barbados, and that's set to run off on April the 28th. And that's our time tonight. Thank you for spending it with us. I'm Pearson Boeing. For the crew, to all of you, good night. By God's will, we'll see you tomorrow.